Hi there and welcome to the first ever episode of my brand new series, Tips on Landscape Photography. So this is something I've been working on a little while now, behind the scenes, and I'm gonna be putting these episodes out every other week and integrating them with my normal content, which is landscape photography vlogs, obviously gear reviews and editing techniques. So you're really looking forward to getting stuck into this. So episode one is all about landscape photography gear, the essential gear you need for landscape photography. Um, now I can break landscape photography down into five key areas. The first being timing and location, the second being lighting, the third being composition, the fourth being technique, and the fifth being equipment. And I think equipment probably falls right at the end of those five key areas for me. It's probably the least important. You can get great shots on your smartphone or a point and shoot if you've got good technique, lighting, and composition. So whatever equipment you've got, you can get out there and shoot landscape photography. You really can. But today we're going to be talking about moving up to a mirrorless camera or a DSLR. You know, if you want to get a little bit more creative for your photography, you want to have have more options when you're out in the field shooting so yeah we're going to break it down all the basics all the essentials that you're going to need to get set up so let's talk about camera bodies and the good news is we don't need all the bells and whistles for landscape photography we really don't there's only a few essential items that we really need and most dslrs will have those items so such as shooting raw a good dynamic range self timer auto exposure bracketing most cameras will have these features and don't get too carried away with megapixels either. 16 megapixels and above is absolutely adequate for most landscape photography cases. You know, if you're just uploading your work to say Instagram or your website or showing your family, maybe printing up to sort of A2 sort of size, 16 megapixels will do you fine. If you're selling your work for commercial purposes or printing massive like A1 prints or something like that, then sure, you'll probably want to go larger with your megapixels. But it was only five, six years ago that I was shooting with a 12 megapixel camera professionally, and that was the industry standard at the time, and nobody thought anything more of it, really. It was just 12 megapixels is more than enough. But obviously things have moved on since then, and we're now talking anything below 24, 25 megapixels is rubbish, but that's just not the case. 16 megapixels and above would do you absolutely fine. These cameras that I use, 24 megapixels, the other one that's filming right now is a 26 megapixels, but it's really not that important to be honest. If we use good technique when we're out in the field and we're not cropping into our images later in post, then 16 is perfect. There are so many great camera manufacturers out there at the minute, all offering very, very good products. The top five would be, in no particular order, Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fuji, Panasonic, all offering really, really good quality equipment, very reliable equipment. And um, don't be drawn into thinking full frame is where you need to be or your eventual goal. Bigger isn't always better. I shot professionally with a full frame setup for around about eight years and two years ago I decided to go to an APS-C size sensor, mainly because of the form factor. Everything's a lot smaller, more portable, easy to transport, lightweight and uh, less obtrusive for my run and gun work that I'm currently doing, my documentary work. So. Yeah, um, you know, don't necessarily think full frame is where you need to be. What I would suggest is looking at lenses and then maybe choosing the body to go with those lenses is probably a good option. Glass will out, outlast a body probably 10 times over. So uh, yeah, investing in the glass and then looking into the body afterwards might, might be the way to go. If you're just starting out, picking up used gear as well can be a very, very good option. I recently sold on a lens that I bought about two or three years ago for 10 pounds more than when I bought it. So yeah, sometimes it can be an investment in more ways than one. So yeah, looking at used gear can be a very, very good option, especially if you're thinking about maybe going say full frame, you could probably spend a bit more on your glass and getting a second hand body. Um, might be able to keep the, you know, the cost down for you because uh, obviously full frame glass is going to be a lot more expensive than APS-C. So yeah, it's just something to think about. And uh, I've bought a lot of used gear over the years. And obviously when you sell it on, you know, you're not really making much of a loss. So yeah, it's definitely worth uh, checking that out. I mean, I would consider going to a dealer that will give you say a year's warranty as opposed to going on eBay. You really don't know what you're going to get if you go on eBay. So let's talk about lenses. Now I'm going to go over lenses in episode two because there's so much to cover and it really does need an episode of its own. But for today, we're talking about the essential equipment for landscape photography. And a good place to start is with a kit lens, I feel. And quite often you can get a kit lens bundled with a body for very little money, a few hundred pounds. And it's a very, very good starting point, actually. Um, an APS-C size kit lens would be 18 to 55. I believe the Nikon full frame, you're looking at 24 to 120. I think 
think Canon do 124 to 105. So a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of focal range there to work in. So obviously you can get your wide shots and you can get some close in shots as well. So offers you a lot of flexibility for little money. So definitely looking to get in a bundle if you can when you're buying your body, if you're buying your body new, something to look out for. So let's talk about tripods. Now I can't stress enough how important it is to have a good set of sticks, I really can't. Um, my tripod is outlasted, I think maybe six camera bodies. It's lasted me about eight years. It's been excellent, it really has. Now it's an aluminium one, it's made by Giotto's. They don't make this particular model anymore, but they do have newer versions. Um, I prefer the aluminium tripod over a carbon tripod. I like the extra weight and the stability that gives, but that's just my own personal taste. And to be honest, I've never tried a carbon one, so I couldn't compare the two. But yeah, the, the aluminium has been great for me. I really enjoy using it. Now, it's an investment, you know, spending a couple of hundred pounds now can save you a lot of money in the future. I wasted so much money buying cheap tripods when I first started out, I really did. And they just wobble about, they break, they're absolutely useless. And if they fall over, you know, you could have your 70 to 200 lens on there and it's a few thousand pounds down the drain. So yeah, investing wisely in a tripod is definitely the way to go. On top of the tripod, you're gonna to need to put a head um, my tripod came with a pan and tilt head and I couldn't get on with it at all. Again, personal preference, but I opted to go for a ball head and this is a Sunway Photo ball head. It's very, very good, very durable, very heavy and yeah, it does, it does take a lot of weight as well. Not that I particularly need that, but yeah, I wanted to go with something that would be future proof for me in case I ever decided to get a larger camera. But uh, yeah, very, very good. On top of that, I've got a quick release plate, which is Arca Swiss compatible. <clears throat> now Arca Swiss make a universal plate and brands such as Peak Design, Manfrotto, Sunway all use the same Arca Swiss compatible mount, so which is very, very good. It means you can take your camera, say, from the ball head and you can put it you can have one on your gimbal. Uh, so you can put your camera straight on your gimbal, quick release plate. Um, also got one here on my monopod, so I can just whack it straight on the monopod if I'm filming something. So yeah, it gives you lots of flexibility. So all of my stabilizers have got um, Arca Swiss plates on, so I can just literally take my camera off one straight onto the other with no faff whatsoever. I would definitely recommend an L bracket for landscape photography. Um, this will give you a lot of flexibility. So an L bracket, will basically mount on the side of your camera and it'll allow you to turn your camera from horizontal to vertical and uh, it saves you recomposing the shot so much if you like and it also helps if you're doing panoramas as well because it'll keep the center of the lens over the center point of the tripod meaning you get a nice clean sweep if you like as you go through the pano so yeah l brackets are very good i wouldn't be without one to be honest I didn't use one for a long time, I only started using one a couple of years ago, but I certainly wouldn't go back. So next up we have filters, and I absolutely love using filters for landscape photography. It just makes me feel a little bit more creative, it slows the whole process down, it gets me thinking more, and I just love getting it right in camera. It's not always possible, sometimes we'll have to use bracketing, auto exposure bracketing, but for the majority of the time I try to use filters wherever possible. I just love the whole process basically. And, but today we're just gonna be talking about one essential filter and that's the circular polarizer, mainly because I think it's a filter you can't replicate in post-production. It's the only filter really that you can't. And it's an essential item, it really is. Um, it's the only filter that will cut through reflection in water. It will saturate the landscape, it will make foliage more saturated, make the blue sky more saturated, it make clouds more detailed. It'll also cut through haze as well. If you've got a particularly hazy day, it'll cut through that haze as well. So it does quite a few different things. And it's very, very important. I really wouldn't be without a polarizer. Now there's a few different polarizers that you can buy. Now it all depends on what system you decide to go for. So if you decide to go for just screwing filters, you've got a lot of options from a lot of different manufacturers. But if you decide to go for a modular system, then obviously it's a little bit more limited. So for example, I use the Format High Tech Firecrest range and this comes with a filter which is within the system so obviously if you're going to go for a modular range i wouldn't go out and buy a circular polarizer that screws on front of your on the front of your lens like this so this is a 
a screw on filter which will sit on front of the lens there and this is a Hoyer Pro circular polarizer which is very very good actually I definitely recommend Hoyer they're a very very good brand so yeah depending on which way you decide to go whether you go for screwing filters or modular system um, will depend on you know obviously which you decide to buy if you go for the modular one it's going to cost you a lot more initially if you go for a screwing one like the Hoyer I think you can pick up for around about 80 pounds so you know if you just want to buy that one filter the screwing might be the way to go if you think you might be looking to get into graduated filters and ND filters then obviously save your money and go save up for the modular system. So one more little tip is if you're buying a circular polarizer is to buy one for the largest lens that you've got. So the largest or the widest thread that I've got is 72 mil and the kit lens is 58 mil. So basically you can buy these step down rings which will allow you to take your 72 down to a 58 and they do lots of different sizes so you can buy a step down ring for every single lens you own meaning you only need to buy one filter so you know 80 pounds for a filter two or three pounds for a step down ring so it's going to save you a lot of money so definitely do that save you buying lots of different filters another thing i use a fair bit is a shutter release cable i only tend to use it when i'm doing very long exposures because you can hold the shutter down uh, on this and also when I'm shooting waves at a beach, a seascape or something like that, and I want to time that wave just at the right moment. If I'm using a long shutter speed, maybe half a second or a third of a second or something like that, and I just want to time it just right, and I don't want to touch the camera for obviously camera shape reasons, I can use the shutter release. You can pick these up fans and very, very cheaply. <clears throat> Another thing you're going to need is obviously spare batteries take two or three spare batteries on every shoot that I go on to make sure that I'm not going to get caught out. I just think worse than uh, not being able to finish your shoot off because you've run out of batteries. So yeah, always carry some spare batteries. Again, memory cards, obviously you're going to need to carry some spare memory cards as well. I use SanDisk memory cards. I think they're very, very good. I've been using them uh, pretty much since I started actually. And I've done a full video on memory cards. Not the most interesting video, I have to say. But um, there's a lot of information on there. I'll leave the link to that in the description below. Um, one thing I would say is watch out for fakes on eBay. And uh, I've heard reports that there were some fakes going around on Amazon, but I think that's been sorted out now. But yeah, definitely watch out for that when you buy memory cards. To keep your memory cards nice and safe when you've taken your images, I recommend getting a hard case. This is a Peli case, but it's uh, essential for keeping your memory cards safe. Now, I've been caught out on the side of a mountain in an absolute downpour, and my whole bag got soaked, and if I hadn't have had a waterproof case for my memory cards, my memory cards would have got wet and probably completely ruined. So, getting a nice, durable, waterproof case, such as this Peli case, is uh, perfect, really, and it's uh, I wouldn't be without it. I've had this for a few years now, and it's... Uh, exceptional quality it's shock proof and waterproof so definitely recommend getting that so that's been my essential landscape photography gear like i said in episode two i'm going to be talking more detail about the lenses so please consider subscribing and hit the bell notification if you want to be notified when that episode comes out so like i mentioned at the beginning i've put together a list of all the bits i've talked about today and the notes from today so if you look in the description below you'll see the link to my website if you click on that i'll take you over to the post that i've done where you see the big list and so i'd love to hear your suggestions for future episodes of landscape photography tips so if you've got any ideas please please leave them in the comments below. If you've got any questions regarding the gear I've talked about today as well, please leave those in the comments and I'll gladly get back to you and help you if I can. So that's it for this week, guys. Hope to see you next week.